No more executions. The accused are hereby charged with taking part in an armed rebellion, waging war against the king, hurting the defense of the realm, and assisting the enemy. 3,226 arrested and brought here. 1,867 deported. 171 names called from the balcony to court-martial. 149 convictions, 90 death sentences, 15 executions. I took silk in 1914 and joined a training program for British officers at the start of the war. We were enjoying a weekend break taking advantage of the scorching weather on the lakes of Killarney. When we heard news of the rising, I took an old T Ford and rattled back to Dublin. The child and our maid were safe and well on the steps of our house in Marion Square. Packing them inside, I left them with my wife, put on my uniform, and went straight to Trinity College, taking up position with the Trinity Officer Training Corps. After the surrender, I was leading two battalions past Dublin Castle, catching the eye of the Attorney and Solicitor General, who, recognising me as King's Counsel, laughed. Pulled from my bed at midnight, bundled into a car, and brought here to prosecute the rebels who'd been selected for trial. These barracks are seething with emotion on both sides, toxic and volatile. <laughs> Hardly conducive to fair trials. Three officers make up a panel of judges. No legal training, no witness, no defense. Like watching a stream of blood seep from under a closed door. They're tried under Dora, Defense of the Realm Act. Absolutely boneheaded. Using martial law to bypass legal process was nothing more than an experiment in special powers. A mockery, a snare, and a delusion. Trials held in camera. Speed, secrecy, hurtling towards oblivion. I pleaded with Attorney General James Campbell to allow legal representation for the prisoners. He said he would give them no public advertising. And he wouldn't be satisfied unless 40 of them were shot. The next accused would wait outside when the trials closed. Each time I'd go out, I'd ask if they had any defense or if there were any witnesses they wished called. Some of the leaders didn't even try to defend themselves. All of them pleaded not guilty, except for Willie Pierce, who seemed determined to join his brother in martyrdom. Tom Clark treated us with icy contempt. John McBride called for his landlady lover. Michael Malin lied, trying to pass himself off as a simple foot soldier. Thomas McDonough said nothing at all. And Pierce. Pierce wore his green volunteer's uniform. Not unlike Robert Emmett, defiant, accepting of the consequence. The evidence against him was damning, particularly his reference to a German expedition. It was all they needed. With her, I had been expecting a performance. I didn't get the one I was expecting. She curled up and began to cry. She was literally crawling. I won't say any more. It disgusts me. In moments of calamity, 
I've sought respite, dreaming of the birdsong, listening to it outside. Have you ever done that? I shut out every obstacle, every extraneous idea. I stop my ears and focus all attention on the sounds of the birds outside, forcing myself out there. Because what is happening inside those rooms makes me want to scream. The Duke of Wellington, winner at Waterloo, defines martial law as the will of the general who commands the army. In fact, martial law means no law at all. <laughs>